Welcome everybody to This Is Reviewable. Micah is currently mad. I literally said I wasn't mad. Yeah, and Micah's not really mad. No, I'm not mad. Welcome everybody. We continue on our journey down the oogity boogity spookity wookity Halloween spooktacular with the menu. Right, Micah? We watched the menu, didn't we? <laughs> We're off to a great start. <laughs> Yeah, we watched the menu this week. What's it about? Why don't you tell us? No, that's your job. Why? <laughs> because, Micah, that's just simply how it is. You always do the best job. I like it when you do it. Anyways, the menu is about this luxury dining experience that happens on a private island. And the is the island called Hawthorne? Yeah. Hawthorne Island? Yeah. And the restaurant is called Hawthorne. And the movie starts off with this girl, Margo, Mm -hmm. Margo and Tyler. They appear to have some sort of couple-y thing going on, but... It's a night for romance. Something. For this luxury dining experience. Yeah. And tickets, or they have to pay over $1,200. No, it's like $2,200, I think. I thought it was. He said $1,250. Was it $1,250? Oh. All right. So over $1,200 for this one evening of dining. And there's a bunch of different people that are there with them as guests in the restaurant. And the movie just goes through, honestly, the menu that the chef has laid out and things happen. I don't know how much you want to give away. in the. It's a, it's a thriller. Kind of scary. It was definitely marketed as like a horror movie when it was yeah when it was first marketed, um, but it's not. It's like horror adjacent maybe, but I wouldn't say, I'd say it's almost thriller adjacent. I wouldn't say it's like a straight up horror movie. No, but it, it definitely has the creeps and the jeeps and a little bit and suspense and, and lots of suspense, mystery and all of that and dark humor. Yeah. Got some lovely dark humor. Yeah. So I don't know how much you want to say more about what it's about. Okay. Did... Without spoiling it. Um, well, let's try this out then for size. Have you seen this movie before? Be honest. Are you asking our fans? I'm phrasing it as if you're lying about things. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Come clean. Have you seen this movie before? Yes or no? I don't think it's just a yes or no answer. It's a yes or no answer. Have you seen this movie I think before? I need more options. It's not linear, or what is it? Binary? Black, yeah, binary. Like yes, that. it is. No, it's not. You have either seen this movie or you haven't. No, I'm telling you, it doesn't work that way. It, that's literally the way it works, and I want you to be truthful. Well, was I sitting there with my eyes open and my brain engaged on the movie before in the past? Okay, Julian Slowick. He remember <laughs> the freaking... Don't eat. <laughs> That's something that he says at the beginning of this movie. He says, taste. Savor. Uh, savor. Absorb. Reflect. But don't eat. eat. Like, almost with disgust. So this is what Mike is doing right now. <laughs> don't watch. <laughs> View. <laughs> hear. Think. Absorb. Absorb. Forgive, <laughs> but don't watch. Movie. What did you like about this movie? Yeah, uh, I really like this movie. I really like all of it. By the way, yes, we have seen this movie before. That's the answer to the question. Anyways, I have liked this movie ever since it came out. I think I, I saw it when it came out, which was a couple years ago, three years ago, maybe. Maybe 21. Yeah, that sounds about right. Because it... It came out right around the end of COVID, 2022. Okay. It says it's a horror comedy. Okay. Um, I think that it's very sharply written. Um, the, the dark comedy in it really works. It makes me laugh every time, basically. And then the suspense elements really work also. And the performances are great across the board. You've got... Anya Taylor Joy, who is Margot, and she's she's good as she usually is. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got Nicholas Holt, who is Tyler. Mm-hmm. He's he's really good in this as well. Yeah. Um, and then of course you have 
That's actually a pretty good cast, honestly. Yeah. But, I mean, the main star of the show is Ray Fiennes as the chef. Julian. Chef Why Julian. is his name pronounced Ray Fiennes when it's pr- spelled Ralph Finnis? Micah, am I his mom? Jeez. What does that mean? Yes! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know that I can't be the only one thinking this. Yeah. Well, yeah, everybody, when they learn how the, his name is spelled for the first time, they're like, uh-huh? Okay. They make that sound. I didn't make that sound. I I made that sound when I first saw his name spelt out. Mm. And I'm sure you did, too. Are you going to ask my question? Why is it that way? Yeah. I have no idea. He's British. Does that help? They do a lot of weird things over there, like putting beans on everything. Okay, so I looked it up, and apparently his so his name his first name is Ralph, but in the UK you would pronounce it Rafe, Rafe. So I think because it's blended, people usually say Ray Fines. Hmm. It's Rafe Fines. Oh. Okay, this is that makes know. more sense. So if we met him in real life and we were on a first name basis, Rafe, we would call him Rafe. Ra. It's R A F E, or it could be R A H F. So, however you would say that. Rafe Fines. Yeah. Rafe Fines. Yeah. Damn. All right. So well, you're welcome. The more you know. Anyways, that's what I like about it. Is oh, it also so yeah. Performances, um, the writing, the humor which I guess, you know, ties into the writing. But also, you know, the way it's shot is very... It's it, very beautiful. Yeah, it's very crisp and clean yeah. and nice. Um, what else was great? I mean, the sets look great. Yeah, and like the food that he prepared looks like definitely some avant-garde bullshit, but still looks good. Yeah, it looks like something you'd like to try but not have to pay for. Yeah, I would never pay $1,250. <laughs> no. To a lesser extent, this is how I feel about sushi, because sushi is very nice, and it's always put together, and it looks pretty, and it's tasty, but ain't no way I'm dropping $50 on a freaking dinner of sushi, and I'm going to leave hungry. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. But if someone else is paying for it, hey, let's go get some sushi. Yeah. Lesser extent, obviously, you get more food than Mr julian slowick is providing in this movie yeah there's one course so they have you know like a starter or a a Mm amuse-bouche and then like their first course and then the next one is like a bread they're supposed to be served bread and he basically is like well i'll give you everything but the bread so he gives them a bunch of like jams or butters or oils like to, to taste with you know dip bread in whatever is what you're supposed to do. But instead they get handed a wooden spoon and say, here, taste all these yeah. add-ons. And then um, Margo is not eating and he comes over and he's like, why are you not eating your food? She's like, there is no food. You have not no, served me. <laughs> no, this is food. <laughs> it's just like funny. That's a funny little joke I yeah. liked. Just the way he says it. No, this is food. <laughs> no, it's not. It's freaking sauce. Um, yeah, but it does, to your point, it looks nice. Like, they all, especially the Al Pastor taco thing. Oh, yeah. That looked really good. These are tortillas. <laughs> tortillas deliciosas. <laughs> so, as as the movie goes, well, let's keep talking about what we like. Um, I was just looking on Reddit to see if anybody, like, had any crazy things to say about this movie. And people just kept saying... Tortillas delicioso. <laughs> That's one of the best lines in the whole movie. Yeah. These are tortillas. Um, so something to note about this, like the plot of the film, when they so the movie starts, they're on this dock, they get put onto a boat, all the guests put onto a boat to be driven to the island, and when they get off, they're supposed to check in with the woman who's in charge. And when Tyler and Margot go to check in Tyler's like, oh, I'm Tyler, or so-and-so. Mm. And then the lady checking them in is like, oh, you must be Mrs. or Miss so-and-so. And Margo's like, no, I'm Margo. And it's obvious that 
She was not expected. Right. By the lady checking them in. And then later on, you know, Ray finds come out. Rafe finds, comes over and talks to Margot and is like, why are you here? Or has her come to the kitchen. Says, why are you here? You're not supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. She's like, why does it matter? You know, she doesn't understand and it's suspicious. Yeah. As, as the evening goes on and as the courses get served, things start to look more sinister and more sketchy. You know, there's something going on here that is not within the norms of a typical dining experience, you could say. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why they're like, because they planned the whole thing. They were not planning for her to be there. Anyways, spo- we're dipping a little bit into spoilery territory now, but I think you can glean that just from the trailer. Um, so it's not that big of a spoiler. But yeah, what else did you like about this? I think that the acting of the kid Tyler yeah. is so good. Really good. He is so obsessed with, what's his, what's where he finds? Julian. Yeah, with. Slowick. Yeah, with Chef Julian. Mm-hmm. With Chef. He is basically, I can't say it. <laughs> Why not? Why not just say it? What no, were you going to say? it's not appropriate. What were you going to say? I'm not going to say it. I'll cut it out. What are you going to say? He basically just has a heart on for the guy the whole time. I don't have to cut that out. That's fine. Yeah, but I just... You're, you're right. He's like his... He's he's obsessed with him. Yeah. He's a big, he's a big like... Fangirl. Wanna, wannabe foodie, wannabe chef. Yeah, he lives and dies by the opinion of Chef Julian. And that's, that's his character. And then you've got Margot, who like is very... She doesn't cynical. Give a shit. She's very cynical about this whole experience. She's not into it. She doesn't like the way that Chef Julian is basically insulting them mm-hmm. with every every dish or whatever. Um, she she's your typical, you know, just give me a burger and fries. That's what I want for dinner. Yeah. Um, and so she's not super into this whole thing. And then you've got the loyal customers who have been to this restaurant. They're super rich, obviously. The uh, old couple? Yeah, you got this old couple that have been to this restaurant 11 times in the last five years, Mm -hmm. which is an insane amount of money to spend on dining. And they seem to also just not even care about the food. They just just go there as a status. Yeah. Like a brag. It's a brag call. Big old brag call. Yeah. And then you've got these finance douche bros... (laughs) <laughs> um, and they work with the angel investor that set up this entire restaurant. So they're there. And then you've got this kind of washed up actor entering the twilight of his career played by John Leguizamo and his assistant. And, and, oh, and then you've got the, this, uh, food critic and mm-hmm. her publisher. Is that who that guy is? <laughs> I don't, yeah, probably. Um, yeah. So, these, these are all the guests, and they all come in their own, like, groups, right? Or, or pairs. In the case of the finance bros, it's, like, a group of three, I think. Yeah, trio. Yeah. Um, and these are all the guests that have been invited. And everybody gets their own time to shine. Yeah. Everybody's okay. great. Yeah. Everybody's great. And, like I said, there's some really funny moments in this movie. To say really many more of them besides the, no, this is food. I think would spoil things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we honestly, I feel bad not giving this more of a review before spoilers, but so much of this needs to be spoilers. Yeah. I it, will say this movie, I was okay watching it. You know, it wasn't too oh, scary for me. Sure. Yeah. Like maybe the first time I watched it, I was kind of like, uns- you know, unsure of what was going to happen, where the movie was going to go. But I think they did a really good job with this movie. Yeah. There's some parts that if you're really sensitive, you might want to look away from. Same. But they give you they give you enough warning that you can do it in time without yes. seeing something you don't want to see. And that being said, like for a rated R movie, the the violence is not that bad. No. It's really not. Um there's a lot of language that should be said. There's no 
sex. Mm -mm. There are allusions to sex, but nothing is shown. Um, Yeah, I think that's good as far as parent guide. One more thing I want to say. This movie is extremely lean. It's very, like, tight focused. Yeah. It's, It's moving towards, says all the things it wants to say with efficiency and gets to the point quickly. It doesn't ever feel too long at the same time doesn't feel too short it runs like about an hour and 40 minutes so it's very like this is an easy one to watch i think it was a really good way to put it It yeah very lean movie there is no excess no no it's great it it doesn't leave you wanting more i would say the fat has been trimmed yeah yeah and and there there's like a brilliant i love the way that they ended it too and we'll talk about that i i think it's really creative yeah It doesn't, it, like, when I first saw the trailers for this movie, I was worried it was going to be cannibal, you know, because you got the menu, and then it's, it's supposed to be a horror, and Mm -hmm. it's, it's about people going to a restaurant. Private island. Like, okay, so this is going to be some sort of cannibal thing, which is a bummer, because it's got all these good actors in it, and that's just a lazy way to do it. If you were worried about that, like I was, and you haven't seen this yet, don't worry, it's not cannibalistic at all. They, they take it in a different direction and a much better direction, much more creative direction. Don't don't skip it because you're worried about that. Yeah, okay, you want to write it? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so, I, I mean, I have really liked this movie ever since I first saw it. So, I'm going to give it a nine. A nine. Paco Jets out of ten. <laughs> Paco Jets. I looked it up. I think... Okay, that's like a device that's used in the movie. It's basically like an expensive ice cream machine. Like, on average, I think they're going for $7,500. That's crazy. From what I could tell. That's crazy. Um, I also really enjoy this movie. Like I, you know, like I will always say, I do not enjoy horror movies, but I enjoy this movie. Yeah. I think, like Brayden said, it's very well made. There are a lot of really funny part, a lot of really witty parts. I would say. Yeah. It's beautifully shot. You know, the color grading of this movie is amazing. I think it's absolutely perfect. And yeah, so I think I'm gonna rate this also a nine, a nine um, chicken thighs. This is one of those ones that is is underrated that more people need to watch. Yeah. I think the first time Braden watched this, he watched it by himself. And I remember the trailers coming out for this and thinking, absolutely not, I will not watch this, you know. Yeah. Braden watched it and like I think the next day he was like, You should watch this. Yeah. And we And we've been evangelizing it ever since, yeah. basically. We've shown it to multiple people. And every time someone says that they love it, I'm like, Thank you. Yeah. It's so good. And a lot of people it feel it feels like at least haven't seen this yet, and they should. Because it's it's one of the better thriller movies I've ever seen. Yeah. You know, le- leaving aside the last five, ten years, it's just one of the better ones I've seen. And it's very, it's one that I th- I find is very accessible to a lot of different people that have a lot of different things that they will or won't watch. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great one. It's a great one to, to show people. So, spoilers. Yeah. Um, let's just jump right into it, I guess. Um. The chef, Julian, has brought all of these guests here because they have wronged him in some way. Yeah, and and I was thinking about this too because... So he can kill them. Yeah, he everybody, including his him and his staff, yeah. and all the guests are going to die yeah. during the course of this menu because basically he, see, he sees these people as partially responsible for ruining his art and his and his life but he sees you know he sees himself as responsible for the ruin of his life as well mm-hmm. and the staff and the culture he's created and so he's like that's it I'm, we're just we're going to end it all yeah we're all going together yeah um and i was thinking about this sorry and that's why it's such a big deal that margot is there yeah cuz because she, she is not on his list she's not supposed to be there um, <clears throat> you were thinking about this. Yeah, and I, 
I was thinking about this and I can't remember exactly why this thought sprung to mind. Like John Leguizamo's character is there for the, for the sole reason that, um, that chef Julian saw one of his movies on a Sunday on his day off and he hated it. Yeah. And that's the reason he invited (laughs) John Leguizamo's character to die. And I like, you know, there's moments like that where you're like, that's such a weak reason to want to kill someone. But like chef Julian is full of inconsistencies and hypocrisies. And, you know, he's this obsessive artist who's, he doesn't have to be right. He doesn't have to make sense. He's clearly out of his mind. He's unhinged. Mm-hmm. And so, I, like, re-watching this again, I was like, oh, yeah, that doesn't really bother me at all anymore, the reason that he, the reason that he invited yeah. some of these people. He's just crazy. He's obsessive and he's crazy. And I'm, I'm, just, I'm just here for it, you know? Um, I was thinking about this this yesterday when we watched this why would all of these employees go down with him Mm -hmm. i'm thinking this has to be it's almost like they're a part of a cult no that's exactly what it is and chef julian is the cult leader because all of these employees live on the island in barracks pretty much and yeah in military grade beds and their beds have to be perfectly made like in the military and their room is completely clean they all live in one room with a toilet that's just out in the middle of the room yeah and they're just all obsessed with this genius of a chef Mm -hmm. and they probably and like this is what was also crazy to me is they stay up until two in the morning with work and then they have to wake up the next day at 6 a.m to start prep yeah yeah, I think he like that's not healthy. His his um his obsession attracts obsession. Yeah, and that's how he's got the staff that he's got, and they're all obsessive, and they all realize that they're miserable. Yeah, and they're ready to go too. Because um, it's not like it was Chef Julian that came up with the idea that everybody should die. No, that was one of his his staff. One of his employees. Yeah, um, this reminds me that this must have been to some degree, what it was like at Apple when Steve Jobs was in charge. Mm. I've been watching, like, this week, I I happened across a couple of, like, interviews of people that worked with Steve Jobs and worked under Steve Jobs. And just the way that they describe him, the stories that they tell about him, what an absolute f prick. Mm -hmm. Like, I, if I had been hired at Apple and had those interactions with Steve jobs, I would, I would stay working there just for the salary, but I would immediately be looking for another job Mm -hmm. just immediately. But these people that I was watching interviews for, they didn't have, they didn't see it as a negative thing, the way that he was treating them. Like he would, he'd pull people into his office, put them under insane pressure to say the right things. Otherwise get the fuck out of my office. like swear at them demean them tell them that their ideas were awful why why aren't you coming to me with better ideas you should you're not an apple person get the f- out of my office you know take people's ideas and present them as his own because he owns the ideas right any ideas they come up with working under him like why would you want to work under someone like that and this movie makes me now think maybe they were obsessive you know mm. like him and and they're more inclined to to forgive that sort of a thing same thing with whiplash right yeah when we we watched it with some some friends and someone was like i would never let someone speak to me like that the way that jk simmons speaks to miles teller or whatever yeah but if if you're obsessed with that thing and you know that he can get you to the heights that you want to reach then maybe you're willing to put up with it yeah anyways um There's one joke that I laughed out loud at the first time I watched this. And it's when, when the actor character is finally standing up and confronting chef Julian, he's like, why, why, why the chef or the, uh, the actor? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. He's like, why, why am I dying? And he tells him, 
you know the yeah you wa- your movie wasted my time <laughs> <laughs> yeah and he's like what happens to an artist when he doesn't care about his craft it's pitiful and he's like okay well what about my assistant and then uh chef julian is like what college did you go to brown did you have student loans no i'm sorry you're dying <laughs> I laughed out loud. <laughs> I thought that was such a funny moment. Just yeah. like, just like, oh yeah, okay. So you you've had a freaking golden ticket your whole life. Yeah. <laughs> You're dying to. Um, I thought I thought that was such a funny moment. Um, the thing so they have thought about every single little thing that could happen mm-hmm. in this experience, this dining experience, because at some point Margot is asked to go get something out of some place in the property. She ends up um, in Chef Julian's house and finds a radio and tries to radio for help. Mm-hmm. And someone that looks like they're in the Coast Guard comes and is like, oh, like somebody radioed for help. Like, do you guys need help? And it turns out that he works for Chef Julian. Yeah. No, he's totally he's totally pinned them in and they're on an island. Right. There's no cell service. There's no way to get off. There's no way to contact the mainland. I just don't think I ever appreciated that moment until yeah. watching it this time. Yeah. Yeah, how how well thought out all yeah. of this is. Yeah. And I, I love the part where he's like Also think about this. This whole time that you've been here, why didn't you try harder to fight back? so crazy if you'd bonded together maybe right. you could have and that's so crazy because you know someone comes running into the restaurant or into the yeah into the restaurant and is like does someone from the coast guard is coming so then everyone on the staff tries to hide stuff that has like been wrong yeah blood stains and all that kind yeah. of thing yeah just to find out that the coast guard guy works for yeah. chef julian oh, and he- is He's just messing with them yeah. because also when he said, when he says you probably could have overpowered us or whatever, I, so I remember that line. And then this time watching the movie, I was paying attention to the staff, mm-hmm. how many there were, how many big guys there were. Yeah, They had people blocking. The and doors. I was like, and I was thinking, there's no way that this group could have overpowered everyone on the, no, on half the island. Half of them are women. So, oh, the guests, you mean? Yeah. yeah. There's like, there is, there's no way. That they would have been able. To, some of these guards are big dudes, and there are no big dudes within the uh, no within the guests, the guest group. And when I say half of them are women, I mean half of them are very slight women. Yeah. Or Anya, old. Anya Taylor Joy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right, and I I loved that detail because I think he's just f-ing with them. Yeah. He's just like there's what? no there's no way they're getting out of this. Well, at some point, the actor comes over to the finance bros and is like. We need to fight back. Yeah. And like the finance bros are like, you really think you're better with like a knife than these guys? Yeah. No. They're, they're all afraid. He no. knew, he knew who he was inviting. He knew yeah. they wouldn't, he knew they wouldn't have the gumption. Yeah. And, and that's that. Um, also, may I say the old, the old guy, the mm-hmm. old couple, what a bitch. I know. I hate that guy. It turns out that he like has been, you're allowed to say prostitutes. Yeah. Escorts. Yeah. Escorts that are the step above what an escort is. He uh, has been paying them, and it turns out that that's what Anya Taylor Joy is. And he has been with her, but and is in a really, a nasty in a really dude. gross way. Yeah. And so they end up cutting off his finger, he's and he's just crying, crying and baby. crying and crying, and you know he won't do anything. There's a chance for some of the guys to escape at some point. And he just is like hobbling off and he's like, I'll send help back for you to his old wife. He's not making it. No. Well, they, oh, yeah. And even if he is, he's not going to try that hard. One of the courses is called Man's Folly. Mm-hmm. And for the course, Julian is like, all the men, we're giving you a 45 head start. You can try second and... Second head start. Yeah, sorry. 45 second head start. You can try to get off the island. And then my staff is going to chase you down. And that's... And this guy has his finger cut off. He's old. He can't really move. He's in a sling. And he still tries to hobble his ass out of there, leaving everyone. You're not making it. No. There's no way. Get out of here. Yeah. 
I like that part because um, Tyler doesn't doesn't run. He doesn't want to go because he wants the whole dining experience. Yeah, and Julian like points at him. He's like, "You too." <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, uh, okay. Can't I? Okay." <laughs> um, you find out that Tyler knew that everyone was gonna die. What a I, great twist that was. Yeah. Also, I because like the whole time, the first the first crazy thing that happens is the suit the sous chef shoots himself yeah and everyone is freaking out except tyler and he's like whoa didn't see that coming yeah and then he's like this food was really good and you're just like what is wrong with this dude and then you find out he knew he he was corresponding with julian the whole time and he was only allowed to come if he brought a date yes and he broke up with his girlfriend and hired on a taylor margo to come yeah knowing she would die yeah so crazy, crazy twist. Really well handled. Really well done. Um, and in the end, he literally lives and dies on the praise of Chef Julian. Yeah. Let's talk about the ending. Okay. Um, so this is an insanely clever ending. There's no way out of this, it seems. Everybody is going to die. Yeah. They've tried breaking down the windows. They've tried yeah. running out. All the guys. One of the guys made it onto a rowboat. And started getting off the island, but he got caught. Yeah, you know, make it. Yeah. everything has been thought of. Yeah. They called the Coast Guard on a radio. Yeah, and it, you know, so there's no way that they're getting off. Right, and um, e- even Julian has said because he brings Margo back, and he's like, "You're not supposed to be here. You're spoiling everything. I need to know where to seat you." I need you're either with us, the, the, staff. the givers, the service people, or the takers, the eaters, and you have to decide which one you're gonna be on. And she's like, "If I'm with you guys, do I, do I live?" She, he's like, "No, don't be silly. Everybody's dying tonight." Yeah. So like, it doesn't so, matter. So he is admitted. Like, no one is getting off this island. Yeah. No one. Margot goes into his cottage. At a certain point, you know, through circumstances, she's able to get into his cottage and she sees all these pictures of him and he's just, he looks exactly the same as he does now. Even when he's younger, he's just got never smiling, kind of got like an emptiness in his eyes. He's obsessive, except she sees one picture where he's smiling and it's when he was wor- he worked like in a diner or something. Yeah. Working at Hamburger Howie's. Is that what it's called? Yeah. (laughs) Employee of the month at Hamburger Howie's. And he's got this big old grin on his face. just Making a cheeseburger. Making a cheeseburger. And then tell tell how uh, that comes into play. You know, it's the dessert course. They're getting, they're about to get ready to start dessert. Which is where everyone's going to die. Yeah. Yeah. And Margo is sitting there. All this shit throughout the whole evening has happened. She stands up. She goes... This part was so cool. You know, she claps her hands in the way that Chef Julian does. And then gives a speech and is basically like, I'm still hungry. Yeah. You have not fed me. And Chef Julian is like, well, what do you want? And she's like, I want a cheeseburger. And you see this like little tiny yeah. smile creep onto his face. And he's like, we could do a cheeseburger. Yeah. Um, another, another part that I forgot to mention that leads into this is he and her are talking at one point and they have great back and forth. Oh yeah. And he, he figures out that she is an escort Mm -hmm. and he asks her if she likes giving her services and she said she used to. Mm -hmm. And then she asks him the same question. And he's like, I used to, but I haven't, I haven't enjoyed cooking for someone in a long time. Mm Mm-hmm. And Margot, and this, by the way, this is not like, this is not necessarily obvious what's going on at the ending. Yeah. Like you, you see the picture. It doesn't linger on it for a super long time. It's, it's the same amount of time as she was looking at the other pictures. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of have to remember that he was smiling when he was making the hamburger. And that's what's going on. She's getting, she's bringing joy back into his, his cooking, you know, because it's a fond memory. Yeah. Because she says that in her speech. Yeah. I, none of this was made with any love. <laughs> and he's like, well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Everybody knows that love is the most important ingredient. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, you're cooking with obsession, not yeah. love. 
So then he makes her a cheeseburger. Yeah. She takes a bite. She said, wow, this is really good. And but... he, he's finally made her something she likes. Yeah. And he's smiling now and he's happy. And you can tell when he's making it. This is the yeah. first time that he is the one making the food. Yeah. This whole evening. And he put so much care into this hamburger and love. Yeah. You can tell. And she takes a bite. She says, this is so good. And you can tell he's happy about that. Yeah. And this is so crazy. And she goes. So smart. I think my eyes were bigger than my stomach. Can I take this to go? And then, yeah. And then you can see the wheels turning in his head. And he's like, should I let her go? And then he's like, yeah. She, she, she earned it. She earned it. Yeah. She She's earned, not supposed to be here. And she earned she it. She earned her way out of this. Yeah. And he packs it up for her. They let her go. She gets out. Everybody else dies. Yeah. What a great ending. Yeah. So, so good. Like, you need to be paying attention to what's going on before, to their conversations. And it all comes full circle. And the, the acting during this this back and forth is so good. Yeah. Especially Ray Fiennes. Mm -hmm. Like, very subtle, like, face twitches and his smile and... All that. It's just, it's just yeah, he's excellent. he's a great actor. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a great... And Anya Taylor-Joy is a great actress. Yeah. Madame Furiosa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Th this is excellent. Excellent movie. Anything else you wanted to say? No. That was up. Okay. All right. I did watch a movie. This is a movie that I said I was going to watch. I'm a man of my word. What's that from? I don't know. The Dark Knight. How was I supposed to know that? Because he says it like that. He says it like that, Micah. He says it like oh that. Oh my gosh. And you're just supposed to remember. He says... Okay, it doesn't matter. Anyways, I watched Pan's Labyrinth. And this is a, a GDT movie, for those of you in the know, that is Guillermo del Toro. GDT. Of course, we all knew that. Yeah. Um... Was that like the part in Community where they called the bare naked ladies B and L? So funny. Yeah. Um, Guillermo del Toro. What can you say about him? He's a Mexican director. He is really good. He's he's done some good work. Um, I think this might have been the movie that kind of put him on the map. This came out in two thousand seven, I believe, and for the longest time. I've been meaning to watch this. It's been on our watch list for years. Oh yeah. I remember seeing the, the posters for this movie when it came out and it looked so freaky to me and I just did not want any part of it. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm not a dumbass kid, now I'm, now that I'm a dumbass adult, I was like, Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm oh, going to probably Hellboy. watch it. Yeah. He did the first two Hellboy movies. He has done... Kronos, The Devil's Backbone, No, 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 Go, uh, Pacific Rim. Well, I'm, I'm doing older stuff than this. He did Puss in Boots? He did The Hobbit? So, okay, but some of these, though, he probably was a producer in, uh... or he had a different role. The ones I know he directed, Shape of Water, which won Best Picture, Pinocchio, um, the two Hellboy movies, he did Pacific Rim, and he, of course, did this one, too. Okay. Um... And what is this about? So it's set during the Spanish Civil War in, in Spain. So this is around the 1940s. And this mom and daughter are making their way downtown, walking fast. Faces flash and they're homebound. Da -da 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 -da. That's right. <laughs> um, no, they're, they're moving to the forest because the mom has married a captain in the fascist regime, Franco's fascist army. And uh, so this captain is um, the little girl's stepdad. The little girl's name is Ophelia. And they're moving to the forest because the captain is sort of stationed there so they can hunt down the rebels, the people that are, you know, causing up ruck the rascals. Um, trying to hunt down the rascals. Ophelia reads a bunch of books, a bunch of fantasy stories, and she ends up finding this labyrinth right next to where they live. And she goes 
down one night and she meets these fairies and this fawn. He's a really kind of a scary looking guy. This thing? No, that is not the fawn. This thing? Yeah, that's the fawn. So he tells her that she is the princess from the underworld. Ophelia is the princess? Yes, and the, the entrance to the underworld is through the labyrinth, and it was foretold that one one day she would return to the underworld um, to live with her, you know, in royal as royalty, as the royalty that she is. Because, like, many years ago, she somehow made her way onto the surface, and her spirit has been reincarnated yeah. many times. And Ophelia is the latest reincarnation of this this princess's spirit. Um, but the fawn tells her that in order to go back home, she needs to accomplish three tasks. And he gives her, you know, the three tasks over the course of whatever. Anyways, it's like a, it's a very, very dark fantasy tale of Ophelia accomplishing the tasks, but also she's still tied to this, you know, this world that's going on. And it's during the Spanish Civil War, and the captain is an absolutely sadistic, mm. evil man. And and just the overlaps and that happen within this world. Her mom is also pregnant. She is pregnant <laughs> with the captain's son. Yeah, there there's a lot going on. I mean, it's a pretty simple story. Like she she is trying to accomplish these tasks so she can get away from this horrible reality that she's in. Mm -hmm. Um, Very violent reality. And a lot of it seems pretty ambiguous. Like maybe this is all in her head, but I think that it, I think that it actually is real for a couple of reasons. So there's this one point, her mom is really sick, getting really sick. She shouldn't have traveled as far as she did during the stage of pregnancy she was at for them to get to the cabin in the woods. And at one point, the fawn gives um, Ophelia a mandrake, which is like... It, a screaming plant? Yeah, it looks just like the thing from Harry Potter. And he says, every morning, make sure that the mandrake is in a bowl of fresh milk under her bed. and Under you, Ophelia's bed? Under the mom's bed. And you need to drop three drops of blood into the into the bowl. And Ophelia starts doing this and the mom starts improving and, and getting healthier and better. Mm. Um, that sounds super sketchy. There are other parts in the movie where Ophelia sees something and then another character comes into the room and that that something is gone. Like they can't see the fawn, for example. Uh, or they can't they can't see so the like fairies. So like Ophelia is talking to the fawn and then like say yeah. her mom comes in. Yeah, or whatever. And they can't see the they can't see what she can see. But at a certain point, the captain finds Ophelia under the bed, yanks her out by her wrist, and then he finds the mandrake under there. Where did the mandrake come from? The mm. fawn gave her the mandrake. Yeah. So I, I think that the fantasy world is real. But it could be like an episode and she's finding these things and the fantasy is her what she thinks is going on. It could be, but also the last task that she gets is the, the baby boy is born and the fawn tells her the last task is she needs to bring the boy into the labyrinth with her. Mm, and it's sketchy. Oh, it's really sketchy. And, um, he, she says, I can't get in. I can't, he's in the captain's office and it's totally locked. I can't get in there. And he gives her a piece of chalk and she traces a doorway, and she's able to go through the doorway into the captain's. Mm. So how did she, how did she get in? Again, it could just be. I think. I don't know. I think. I think that that the two things are true at once in this case. She's making it up, and it's happening. Like I think that somehow the other people can't see this world, but it's also real. Mm. That's what I think about. That, that's that's how I came away f- feeling about this. Yeah. Um, but it is, man, it is not a, it's not for kids. <laughs> Let's just say that. The captain is very brutal and very sadistic with the people that he tortures and kills. Sad. And, um, 
and it's spooky. It's a spooky movie. If you want a, but it's very, very good. I, I'm not going to lie. It's very good. It is in Spanish. So unless you speak Spanish, you're going to be using subtitles because don't watch the dub. That's dumb. <laughs> Just watch, watch it in the original language as it was intended. It's important. I always feel like it's important to hear the real actors voices and the way that they deliver things. Well, from what I've noticed from that one show that I watched dubbed dark. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> What they're saying and what the subtitles are saying don't usually line up. Not yeah, always. Right. So it's better to read the subtitles because that's what they want yeah. you to be reading, in my opinion. And it's still not going to be perfect, no. but, but also because the translation can never be perfect. Yeah. But you're still going to get their emphasis that they decided to put on it. You're going to hear their voice. It's yeah. going to match with their lips so that you're not going to have that weird disconnect that you get with anime dubs. Anyways, besides the point, I really liked this movie. I'm going to talk a little bit about spoilers in a second, but I'm going to give this an eight and a half um, fawns out of ten. Okay, uh, into spoiler section a little bit. Some of the special effects do not hold up in this movie. Everything that they did practically, so the fawn, looks amazing. Um, that really creepy thing that you saw with the eyes in his hands yeah. looks amazing. Um, the fairies, they're all CGI, and it's 2007 CGI. They don't look amazing. 2006. Six. Okay, 2006 CGI. They don't look amazing. But there's not so much CGI in it that it's obnoxious. It, it ruins it. So it, it still holds up mostly really well. There is a part... Um, the first the first thing that Ophelia needs to do is she needs to go into this like tree where this gross frog is and get a key from him. And then... She needs to go into the lair with that creepy guy that has the hand, the eyeballs in his hands. Mm -hmm. She needs to use that key to open a safe and pull something out of it. It ends up being a dagger, like a golden dagger. And then the next task is to bring the dagger and the child into the labyrinth. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see where yeah. this is going. And there's a and there's a statue in the in the labyrinth when she first goes down there. And it's a fawn, a girl, and the girl is holding a baby. And Ophelia is looking at it, and the fawn, you know, creeps out of the shadows, and he's like, ah, I see you're looking at the, the sculpture or whatever. That's me, and that's you. She's like, and who's the baby? And then he changes the subject. Because that's her little brother. That's her little brother that she's supposed to take down yeah. there. And so the last thing that's supposed to happen is she is supposed to shed the blood of an innocent in order to get back into the labyrinth. And she refuses to do it. She doesn't do it. And then the uh, the captain saw her stealing the baby. So she he follows her into the labyrinth. Takes Ends up where she is, in the middle of the labyrinth. Takes the baby back. Shoots Ophelia. Kill, oh my gosh. Kills her. Oh my gosh. And she falls dead. And her blood drips down into where the... Yeah, wherever it's Where needed. the kid was supposed to be. And then in the epilogue, she's she's in the underworld again. And she's oh. reigning. And and this was the test. She needed she needed to not be willing to shed the blood of an innocent, but shed her own blood, basically. Interesting. To make her way back into the underworld. And the fawn is there and her king mom is there and her or whatever her king dad is there <laughs> and her queen mom is there and she's there and that's how this movie ends but but it also ends with tragedy because the people that loved ophelia find their way into the labyrinth and she's dead yeah and it's sad super sad happy part though the freaking captain gets killed which is great <laughs> um but yeah this is this this was a very dark and but a very interesting and spooky tale. The the reason that I knocked it a little bit, there's this the part where she goes to get the dagger. The fawn tells her, You're gonna be in this room, there's gonna be a huge banquet. The thing that lives there is not human. You do not eat anything. Do not eat any of the food while you're there. Your life depends on it. He says this to her. And when she gets there, the creepy thing is sitting at the head of the table, mm -hmm. but, but it's not moving. It doesn't know that she's there. It can't perceive her at all. And then Ophelia gets the dagger, 
And then she just decides to eat three grapes. Hmm. Dipshit. Stupid. He told you in no uncertain terms. Yeah. Don't eat anything. Your life depends on it. And I was like looking this and there are fairies there as well, like trying to stop her from grabbing the grapes. And she just like brushes them off. And I was trying to figure out like, why did she do that? Was she under some kind of a spell or like, what was the deal? Yeah. And what I was reading is, no, she's just disobedient. That's like a theme. Is she's disobedient to her mom, disobedient to the captain. So she's a naughty kid. She, Yes. Why would you even risk that? Yeah. There's this creepy monster. Because now can the creature see her? Yes. Yeah. And it puts the eyeballs into its eyes and, and it can see her. Well, and the worst part of it is when she gets into the room, there's murals all over the ceiling of this creature eating children. Holy shit. And then there's a ton, there's like a pile of like children's shoes in the corner. It's like, why would you risk it? <laughs> all the evidence is like, if I, if I wake this thing up, it's going to eat me. Yeah. Anyways, I, Ophelia loses the movie one and a half points for her, <laughs> for her stupid decision to eat those grapes. There's no reason for her to be eating those grapes. Yeah. Anyways, that's it. Okay. So, Brayden really wants us to watch The Machinist this upcoming week. Oh, are you open to that? I'm kind of freaked out, but if we watch it on the correct night, maybe. Okay. Um, so, that's the, that's the plan, Stan? I guess. So, I think that's what's coming up. But don't be surprised if I chicken out and we watch something else. Like what? I don't know. The Curse of the Were-Rabbit? Or Charlie Brown Halloween? Uh, okay. <laughs> That's going to be like a little bonus thing if we do that. It's like only 20 minutes long. Okay. Well, have a great week, everybody. Bye.